Great, so I uh, thank you very much. Very good morning to everyone. Um, this is our second lecture for the entrepreneurship course. And um, the first lecture, I think, went very well for, uh, I hope, for you. And uh, I'm sure for the online students from the feedback that I have uh, received, which is available on uh, open learning. As I uh, told you, I would like to create as much interaction between the two groups as I possibly can have. So um, this coming Friday for the tutorial, I invited whoever can come physically to come to the class. And there are a few uh, requests already. Um, also, I uh, invited um, those on online students to um, sort of dial, dial in using maybe FaceTime or Skype or whatever technology you are uh, comfortable with and uh, have a discussion uh, with you um, in, in, in real time. So uh, to enable this, I really would like you to update your profile picture and also update your page on open learning, clearly indicating that you are um, on-campus students so that the online students can, uh, can contact you. So I have some uh, comments here. Um, these are, at least these are three people who are, who are interested in joining the um, on-campus um, teams. Um, the second gentleman, as a matter of fact, is going to drive all the way from another state. So three hours kind of drive to be with us on Friday. So he, 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 he runs a, a green technology company. And I think those who are thinking of a project uh, related to green technology, that would be actually a very good uh, opportunity to uh, collaborate with him. Now, what I would like to say is don't wait until Friday. So if you are interested in this, go and visit his, his page, see the comments that he has put, establish uh, some contact so that when he comes, he's actually looking for you as well, rather than he's, he, uh, he spent the two hours explaining to you what is the project all about or what is the product that he's selling. So there'll be a better use of time. Is there any question before I start about uh, the course or uh, the first lecture, the tutorial that we had? Okay, so let us move on then. So today I'm going to talk about the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So I'll talk about the customer segments. I'll talk about the value propositions. And this, these are things that we've, we spoke about briefly during the uh, tutorial last Friday. I'm, I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about the channels through which the value is delivered to our customers and also to the revenue and cost, basically the money and its importance in, in any entrepreneurial um, endeavor, even if it's non-profit kind of endeavor, money is extremely important. And we'll talk about the resources that we have in order for us to run a successful um, uh, entrepreneurial um, kind of uh, undertaking. Then I'll talk about the different business activities and I will talk about partnerships and then we will talk about the assignments that you'll need to uh, complete after this lecture. So the entrepreneurial ecosystem is an environment in which business value is created and delivered, and sometimes it's also called business model. I prefer the, the um, ecosystem because it's, it's a wider kind of concept, but sometimes people say, so what's your business model? I think they are generally referring to the same thing. Now, the, the term that's gonna be repeated again and again and again in the course is value. So entrepreneurship, as we say, is about adding value, giving the customer, the user, people, something that they can use, something that's beneficial, something that is of value to them. So, um, since it's an ecosystem, I just want to um, uh, try to share it with you in, 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 in a comic kind of cartoon kind of way. 
And uh, let's see how uh, this helps us to frame our uh, thinking and also hopefully to remember it in the future. So if it's told as a, as a story, you will, you will uh, hopefully remember it um, later if you want to recall it for your work or for the exam. So this is, this is, um, this is an ecosystem. You have a tree, you have the fruit, and uh, you have the environment, um, and you have people around it doing variety of things. We are going to talk about this one by one. But I will start with the fruit. So if the fruit was really the value proposition that your entrepreneurial activity is established to deliver. So the value proposition we said is what are you doing? So if you are baking, what kind of cake you bake? If you are a university, what makes your degrees different? If you are a car manufacturer, what makes your cars different from the competitor's car? So these are the, this is, this is the central part, which is the value proposition or the fruit of your entrepreneurial activity. Now to achieve, to, to have any meaning for the fruit, there should be a customer who sees this as something that he or she is interested in, willing to pay for, or at least willing to use. So here you see two types of customers. So this is um, a guy that literally the value is falling in his hand. So it's sort of a free thing that is given to him. But maybe you have another type of customer who is, you know, you need to go to him and make sure that you deliver not only one uh, apple or fruit, but a number of them, put them nicely in a, in, a, in a basket and make sure that this guy is satisfied. So most likely this is a paying customer. Maybe this is a, a customer that you deliver the value to him for, for free. Now, for you to deliver the value or for this tree to generate the apple or the fruit in general, you will need resources. So in terms of, the, in terms of this, uh, this um, tree, what, do, what resources do we need? So, yes, yeah, we need soil, we need water, we need the sun, we need oxygen. So all these are necessary. So you imagine that in terms of your entrepreneurial or business idea, what you have under you is really the soil. So this soil would be your skills, your capabilities, your, your ideas, the languages that you know, the contacts that you know. This is, this is within you. Now, if for whatever reason, the resources that this soil has is not enough, what would, what, would, what would you do as a farmer? You will buy maybe some fertilizer or you will add uh, uh, other things to the soil to make it a better soil. So if, if the fertilizer doesn't come from you, where do you get it from? From a third party who will either give it to you for free or sell it to you. So we call these people partners. So this is a partner delivering something for you over there. And within the tree, for this fruit to take place or happen, or for this value proposition to be created in the first place, the tree needs to do some activities. What, what happens within the tree? So you have photosynthesis, you have you know, the, uh, the water that comes from the roots, goes to the um, to the uh, leaves and so these are activities that the the tree need to do in order for the tree to deliver the value proposition same thing if you are having um, a company or uh, a charity or uh, an entrepreneurial kind of endeavor you will need to do variety of activities for you to ensure that the value is being Deliver. Now, for the whole thing to happen, for you to be able to purchase 
the uh, fertilizer and whatever you need from your partner, what do you need? You need money. So this is an important part we will talk about, which is the, the cost and revenue. So whom you'll be charging so that you create revenue and how you, how you charge them. How do you, de how you develop your, your, uh, your cost? Now, while you are happy working on, your, on the delivery of your uh, business value, there'll be some other people, your competitors, who are very interested in your customers. They would like to come to the customer and say, look, we have another value proposition that is maybe better, cheaper, faster, whatever. So this, this will be people in the environment who are interested in sort of disturbing your business activities with the intention of competing with you. This is generally is a good thing for the consumers. So the more competition we have, the more efficient, effective we will be, and generally the competition gives the customer what? More value. So the more, the more people compete to satisfy the customer, that will drive innovation and will drive the prices uh, down. The uh, other very important thing when it comes to the ecosystem is the business environment. So here you see it is your, your, your wind, your sun, your um, uh, clouds. And, and this is really what is happening, for example, if I'm working in Malaysia compared to me working in China. The business environment is different. Uh, the legal system that I'm working within is different. So we need to be aware that if I take this apple tree and plant it, let's say, in the desert, will it give me fruit or not? Maybe not. But what should I do? There are ways to do it. So I need maybe to create an artificial environment for it. Or I could you know, um, change the environment somehow or protect it from the environment. But that would be adding to my uh, business activities that I'm, uh, I'm talking about here. So this is really a story of how a fruit is created. But I would like you to always remember that this is also an analogy to how we, de how we develop and create and eventually deliver the business value or the value proposition to our customer. Is this clear? So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take this segment by segment and I'm going to talk about it in, in more details. The intention is by the end of this lecture, I'll, I'll give you a hint to the assignment so that you start also thinking. I will want every one of you on campus and online to pick a business or a company or an entrepreneur and take this picture and then write what kind of customers they have, what is their value proposition, what business activities you think they do, who are their partners, what resources do they use? What, is, what kind of business environment they are operating in? And who you think their competitors are? This could be anything. You could pick Taylor's University as a business. You could pick Wikipedia as a, as a business. You could pick Google. Or you could pick even the person who have uh, sold you your breakfast this morning. You, you could pick anything. So that's really your choice. So what I'm going to provide you with, uh, with a clean copy of this at the end of the slide. I would like you to take it in whatever way, handwritten, and take a picture of it with your phone and upload it. But I would like you all to upload one. And the company, this is an individual effort. You pick the company that uh, you are more familiar with or you are happy or and interested in, in analyzing and sharing. So I hope this will... Um, if, you, if you, for example, you start thinking, oh, I'm going to discuss uh, Yahoo or Google or uh, uh, Toyota or whatever, um, as I go segment by segment, you'll be able to uh, you know, ask maybe some relevant questions uh, to, to that. So I'll talk first about the customer. So 
we really need to ask ourselves this question. It may be a trivial question, but it's extremely important question. Who are our customers? In whatever business that you have, who are your customers? So I'm going to ask some questions, so maybe you need to get the mics and, and, and try to answer me. Okay, for, for our university, who are the customers? So can we have the mic here, please? So who are the customers for our university? Students. The students. Who agrees with him? Okay. Okay, very good. Um, so those who raise their hands, how much did you pay the university to be here? Yeah. Maybe you can pass the... How much did you pay the university? Dominique? 13,000. Did you pay it or someone else paid? Parents. So actually your parents paid. Okay, so, so who are really our customers? Is it the students or the, the, the parents? Parents and the sponsors. So now it's parents. Okay, so who, who have changed his, his or her mind? Who think now um, it's not really the students, but their parents are our customers? Maybe a show of hands? Anyone change his mind? Yeah, you, you, you just say it. So you think, you think it's both. But you see, until I ask myself the question, everyone would say that the students are the customer. Now, if I just think that the students are my customers, do you think this will drive me in a certain way to, uh, to satisfy the customer? Let, let me just push the argument. So what, what do you think students really want? What will make the students, Chris, what will make the students happy? What will make the students happy? Honestly. All right. Uh, I think the students would be happy if they have an enjoyable time. That right. means they um, kind of get classes that they like. Yes. And lectures that they feel that they can learn from. Right. As well as facilities that, you know, uh, help them in their education and as well as their extracurricular activities like sports and so on. Right. So do you, do you think this is, uh, you, you stay with me, do you think this is very much aligned to what the parents also want? Honestly think, speaking. Um, honestly speaking, I think parents only want half of it, which is a good education. Yes. They don't really care if there's facilities or that kind of thing. I mean, it matters, but to them, as long as they get a good education, it can be at a university that does not have facilities as well. Yeah. So, so sometimes, you, you guys, so we agree that parents and students are our customers, but uh, your parents don't really care whether the class starts at 8 or 10. As a matter of fact, maybe they would prefer that the, the class to start at 8 so that you develop the habits of waking up early and so on. Right? Now, but how many of you is excited about coming to my class starting at 8 a.m.? I have one who's excited too. And, 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 and interestingly, the person, the second person who's excited came late. <laughs> Am I right? You came late, right? No? A bit late, okay. But late nonetheless. So, so this, this is an extremely important question. And, and the reason is, if I say, let me satisfy the customer. You guys don't want classes in the morning. You don't want the lecturer who's a bit strict. You want to have an enjoyable time. So I could literally make the course very easy, and, and we, we, um, I don't put pressure on you, and uh, you'll be very happy with me. But maybe the other customer, the paying customer, the one that really pay, pay your fees, that contributes to my salary, will be not that happy. So it's extremely important to ask yourself whether, you are, whether, you pro, whether your project that you want to work on is a, is a gym or a restaurant or a whatever, you just ask yourself, who is really my customer? And ask yourself this question in a deep manner. Give it a thought. And you think, who is paying? Who is not? Who is getting the service for free? Who actually doesn't care if even the class is, is rescheduled? So this is an extremely important question. Don't take it lightly. Try to really give it a, a thought.
Then you ask yourself, what do they value? What do they want? So just like what we said here, what do their parents want? What do the sponsors want? What do the, um, the, uh, the students want? And, and you try to see, can you really satisfy all of them? Or can you put them into different segments and try to satisfy their needs in different ways? And we are going to talk about this uh, shortly. So the customer segments is um, something that we have just talked about. So c maybe if my customers, as a, a private university, is both parents and students. And maybe sometimes the needs of these two different segments may differ slightly. So how do I, um, do I focus on those who pay? And I say, look, someone has paid me and I have to do it. Or do I try to satisfy both? It, it really depends on what you are, uh, what is your project and how do you intend, and what is your value proposition and how do you intend to deliver it? So sometimes you have what we call the mass market. So you know why is this? I think Air Asia now is, are you aware of Air Asia in Finland? Have you heard of it? So this is, this is a Malaysian company, but I think has developed a sort of a global kind of reputation. Can you, can you read its tagline? It's written on the plane. Yeah, someone, can you read for me the tagline, please? Yeah. yeah. Anyone can fly? Now, everyone can fly. So what does that tell you? Is this a small market, a big market? What, what, they, are, what they are targeting? So they are targeting the mass market. They want everyone can fly. And by everyone, it means everyone. So the people who, so who do you think they are competing against? Who, uh, competing against who? I won't show, show of hands, you know, let's show the online students that you guys are very interactive. Okay, give to Chris, but next time someone else, yes. I guess they're competing with major airlines because Air Asia is still a budget airline. Right. So they are trying to uh, break into the market sure. that allows a lot more people, like those who are not so wealthy, to be able okay. to travel. As well. So Chris says that Air Asia is competing against Malaysian Airlines, which is the national carrier, the major airline here. Who agrees with that? And who doesn't agree with that? Who doesn't agree with that? Okay, let me ask you a question. Is everyone really flying with mass? Malaysia Airlines system? So, so for example, if you want to go prior to Air Asia, you want to go from here to another state that is three or four hours by, by car, would you consider using the Malaysian airline at that time? No. But now people are considering Air Asia. So Air Asia is competing against whom? Yes? No, no, who is the competitor? The low cost carriers, maybe. Who is the other low cost, low cost in the country? Fireflies. Okay. I would like to propose this thought to you that Air Asia actually competes against the bus competes against the train and competes against you driving your own car. They make it so cheap that it doesn't make sense to go by bus. You know, sometimes the, 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 the fares start from like 10 ringgit, right? Which is, which is cheaper than the bus. So, so these people are really targeting the mass market. So this is something very functional, no frills. You go in, sit down. I, actually, I remember when they first started, they don't even assign you a seat. Now they do assign you a seat. But previously, people just rush, and everyone, just like a bus. So this is, this is a mass market. Now, um, you like this car? Do you think this is a car that can have the tagline, now everyone can drive? So clearly, 
Ferrari is targeting a very small market, and they are actually making it very clear that this is only certain people can purchase it. This is extremely expensive, and it's a kind of status uh, kind of product. So they are openly not uh, 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 advertising on uh, Google, and because you, this is not the, the market. It's not the mass market. They, are, they have very specific and niche and small market. So when you think about this, you think about your customer. Because often when I spoke to those who have been talking about their, their project the, on, on Friday, when I say, who's your customer? Everyone say, everyone, everyone is my customer. But actually, if you really think about it, is it really everyone is your customer? Is my mother your customer? Is my child your customer? Oh, no, 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 uh, I, not children. So, oh, so it's only adults. Okay, so is everyone is really your customer? Then slowly you realize that your customer are maybe adults from 25 to 35 years of all, old who earn that much money. Then s suddenly you realize, oh, yeah, it's not really everyone is my customer. And that will drive plenty of things as we move on. Now, this is actually a picture. All the images are from Google Image, so I've credited the source. This is a picture of the um, first class or in, in Emirates. Now, if you fly Emirates, if you want to fly economic class, it's entirely up to you, and they have the place for you. If you have the money, they could put you in front of the plane, and there are so many other facilities that will make your, your um, experience you know, much, much better. So this is what we call a segmented market. So this airline literally wants to give uh, uh, relatively affordable tickets that's within the same plane. So the plane is going, let's say, from Kuala Lumpur to Dubai. And the big chunk of the seats are given to people like me who fly economy. So they will give you reasonable food. Um, entertainment is quite good. Food is OK. But if you can pay, then there is some reserved seat for you in front. So this air airline clearly saying that I would like to take this and this segment, this segment and this segment of the market. But there is there's a thought behind it. So they don't just simply say, no, everyone can fly. They, this, is, this is not their philosophy. They work in a, in a different way. Um, some businesses are very diversified. So they, they, take, they try to take from A to Z. So for example, um, banks in general, um, they will give you a small loan. They will give, me a hu they will give you a huge loan. Uh, they, they have packages uh, for um, um, saving accounts if you are a student that can start with very small deposits. And even if you are a business that you are taking loans in the hundreds of the millions. So they, they generally they have products that cater for, for uh, a diversified uh, uh, market. Now, why, why I think the diversified is different from the mass market? The mass market is the same product given to everybody. But the diversified is when I say, no, for students, I have this. For those uh, in the early career stages, I have this product. For those who are um, uh, you know, accomplished and they are now, it's time for them if I'm a bank to purchase their first home, to purchase their first car, then I have a different, a different uh, product. So that's in terms of the diversification. Yes, please. Question there? Just wait for the mics. Let's, because uh, I think this is the first question in the course. Yeah, so I'm very excited. I wanted to get this re recorded. I don't understand uh, what is the difference between the segmented and diversified. Right. So you have one plane. It's the same plane going from, going from um, Kuala Lumpur to Dubai. Right? It's served almost by the same people. But you, within this, you want to say, if you have 3,000 ringgit, I'll put you in this seat. If you have more money, I will put you in, in the front end. So I'm, I've sort of cut the thing, I've segmented it. Now, if I am diversifying my, my, my business, 
I could literally have, um, let, and let's say I am in education. Okay. So now you, you know Taylor's is an education group. Now you know that Taylor's has a university. Now you know Taylor's has a college, right? Taylor's College? Now the customer and the way the value is delivered and the way the students are served in Taylor's College is very different from Taylor's University. Now, Taylor's Education Group has, you are aware that they have uh, some schools, primary schools and high schools. You are aware of that. Actually, my son attend one of these schools. And it's a totally different ecosystem. So it, it, it's very different. It's within the same thing, within the same group, but it's very different. It's run by totally different people, it has a totally different culture, so you build something else to cater for this. While the segmented one is, I, I, I can give you another example for the segmentation, the telcos. So you, you, how much is your, uh, the, the plan that you are using? So you're using prepaid, right? I'm using another plan. So I'm using a, 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 a postpaid plan. Now, even within the postpaid, there are different, different packages. But if you think about it, they, they service all with the same outlet, using the same infrastructure. It's only to, they are interested in you, but they are interested in me as well. And they are interested in the others. So they develop different, different packaging systems to segment the market. So when they talk among themselves in their marketing uh, in, the, in the marketing strategies, they will say, okay, this is for those who are students. So are, we think the budget is within this. The moment we go beyond that, we lose them, they'll go to the competitor. Is, is it clear now how the segmented compared to the? Thank you very much. I really appreciate the question. Very good question. Thanks a lot. Any other, any other question about the customer part? Because this is extremely important. And as we move on and as you are developing, business uh, models and business plans and describing the uh, entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem, I'll be grilling you again and again and again, who is your customer and what does the customer want? So you will need to avoid telling me, uh, I'm sure that the customer wants this without really doing uh, a study, just because you went maybe one day to, uh, to uh, a restaurant and you saw that mostly people in suits eating there just because they had a company event and you say, I think people in suit like to eat sushi. So I'm going to you know, sell the sushi to everyone who is wearing a suit. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll move on then. The other extremely important and central notion is the value proposition. So the value is, what can you provide? Why do, you, why do I want to get this thing from you? Why should I listen to you? Why should I come to your university? Why should I use your service? Why should I uh, uh, buy that phone? Why should I use this company or you know, this telecom service over the other one? And the value proposition can happen in a number of ways. And, um, I, I want to I tell you a story of a product, and then I'll link this to the value proposition. So let's talk about the mobile phone. So this is a picture of a new, uh, sorry, one of the earlier models mobile phones. So they are uh, it's quite heavy. Battery is very heavy. You need a bag to, uh, so the accessories at the time was, you know, leather bag or maybe a trolley to carry your mobile phone. And for at that time, when they come and someone wants to sell you this, this, is, this was very expensive. Expensive, you are talking the price of maybe 10 iPhone 5 to get this. Extremely expensive, okay? Works only in a small area. So it doesn't work everywhere. And it's very expensive and highly unreliable. So how do I come to you and say, wow, I got the product for you. Man, this is, this is great. This is wonderful. 
You see this? It's very heavy. It's not that reliable. It will work maybe 20, 30% of the time. And you know, it's extremely expensive. I really think you should buy it. Is this how I, you think I should sell or tell you this is the, the value, uh, value proposition? So how do you think I will, I will, I will, I will tell you this? How, how, how do you think I'm, I'll market this to you? I guess during that time, that was the first. Yes. So I said, do you want to be the first one to have this new technology? You know, this is like even the president of the United States doesn't have it. You'll be the first to have it. I think it really suits you. You are the man. So you will, you will say it's new, it's novel, you'll be the first. Now, this is always the story of almost any product. The cars before the Ford used to be extremely expensive also. And at the same time, they were unreliable. They often break down. So if you want to a reliable product, you get the car that's pulled by horses. But this car that costs you the price of 10 carriages, maybe, is, is, is something to say, look, you are, you are the man. So it's on novelty and newness. Now, as you move on, the, the performance improves. S still, I mean, this is still also cost, I don't know the price of, this used to be a 5,000 US dollar, I believe, when it was released. So that's 15,000 ringgit. So how many, how many iPhones you can buy? Quite a bit, yes? Seven, you can buy seven iPhones for this. But at that time, this was, this, the concept wasn't, wasn't really new. Now few people who are successful, rich enough, they do have a mobile phone. But this came as a reliable alternative. This is something that you know it will work. The network is established, still expensive, but now when I come to you and say, Dominic, do you remember the phone that I sold to you? Look, I got this, and this will work. I mean, it's still almost the same price, but this will, will really work. So you talk about performance. So now the performance has, has improved. Then you move on, and then you come with a phone. It's a new. It's very reliable, but it's very cheap. So now I can give you a phone that you know, can send texts, can make calls, uh, battery life is very good, uh, relatively light, and it's quite cheap. Then you move into the mass market. So these are actually the picture, these are all mobile phones, you know, like piled together. So the phone becomes something that can do the job. So what, what do you want? You want to make a call? You want to send a text message. This is something that can do it for you. It will work all the time. So this becomes maybe your value uh, uh, proposition. Then you start to say, oh, this one has a bigger screen. Uh, the design looks different, and, and, and so on. So this is actually the sort of a life cycle of how the value proposition of new product is, uh, is achieved. Now, this will be repeated again and again and again. So when, when the uh, iPhone first released, it was new. There were some, you know, the touch screen was new, the gesture were, were new, and, and it was sold literally on, this is a new thing. This is a new era in the way we communicate. Uh, iPhone, I don't know whether you remember or not, had issues with the, with the, uh, uh, with the performance a number of times. And uh, as they move on, it become, you know, better and better. But now, um, I think the, the other competitors also have a similar, uh, everyone's using the same, almost the same gestures. They are becoming uh, a normal way of doing things. So every, my son even goes to the, to, the, to the TV and try to expand the picture by using this, this gesture. So this becomes not really new. Um, the new generation even don't even think that Apple has sort of pioneered this. This is, this is something that we should have been doing all, all the while, isn't it? So the, the process will continue. Now, if you were to come 
to uh, the mobile business and you want to come up with something new, it, it better really be new. So maybe it's, uh, you will make the first phone that you can make a call with a thought. So I think of uh, Asad and my phone will call him. And these things will, will happen, you know, in sooner or later. So that will be a new technology. It will be quite expensive, but they will come and say, look, this will work. And sometimes maybe I call Asad, but it, it goes to another call in the beginning. This is expected. This is expected. But people will say it's okay. You know, it's, the technology is getting there. I'm the only one who's having it until it becomes like, I, I think of Asad, it, it will go to Asad and becomes like a feature that's expected in each and every phone. So what I'm trying to say here is when you think of the value proposition, you think, is this new? Does it give a very good performance? Is it something that have very low cost? Is this something that really just gets the job done? So I'm stripping everything. You want to go from point A to point B. You want to spend the least amount of money. You, you use my airline. I won't be charging you for, you don't want to eat? I won't charge you. You want to eat? I'll sell to you. So I won't, I won't give you a meal that maybe you don't want to eat and charge you for that. And um, if your design is different, now this is, some of these things may be uh, relevant more to certain industries. I give you an example. F fashion industry. I mean, h how different is the shirt for the last one, one, 100 years? It's very similar, isn't it? But what do we do? We change the design. So the design becomes extremely important for you to buy a new shirt or a new, um, um, new glasses. Or, because in terms of the technology, in terms of the function, it's, it's really the same. The, the, there is no new, newness in it. But we use the design to say, oh, this is a new design. This is something, this is something different. Um, you also can buy because of the brand. So if you are selling um, uh, a Mercedes or a Ferrari or you know, high-end cars, I think you mainly sell it. I mean, you will say, look, performance taken for granted, but you, you won't sell that on, for example, mileage, right? You won't say, you know, this, this Ferrari will give you how many uh, kilometer for one, one liter. You, you sell it on, you know, this is a performance car, and very few people can afford it. It can really put you within an elite group of people. That's, I think that's the way um, it is sold. Uh, the uh, value can be also through risk reduction. Uh, if you are an insurance company or uh, if, you are, if you have uh, a product that uh, seldom fails, uh, satisfy your customers better, then this could be. So when you write your value proposition, please think of these terms. So the, we, we finished two important uh, components of the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. So the first one was the customer. Who are the customer? What do they want? Who are really your customer? And what do you think your customer wants? And the second one is the value proposition. Any question regarding this? Now, how do I deliver the value to my customer? How do I deliver that basket full of fruits to my customer? So I will go quickly through this. You will need to create awareness. So if you have something new, you need to first make me feel that I need this phone or this car. How is this going to make my life better, make me uh, more productive, uh, enable me to um, make cheap fo phone calls or uh, uh, take notes easier or whatever. So you have to make me aware first as a customer. You also have to do marketing. And um, this is always linked to a clear identification to who, who your customers are. So if you think your customers are um, students, and uh, students that are always online. So the online uh, 
marketing is, is maybe very effective. But if your, stu your, uh, your um, customers are people who don't really go online, who don't have a Facebook account, you reckon, I think uh, advertising on Facebook is just a waste of, of your money. Um, you need to evaluate your, 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 your customers, evaluate their needs. Uh, sometimes the evaluations happen in terms of um, if, I, if I have a bank and you apply for a loan, I need you to evaluate you whether you are suitable to be paid, to be given the loan or not. So if you are a student, you don't have an income, uh, you, good luck to you, try to go and get a, a loan from a bank to buy a house or a car or uh, you, you won't be able to get this. So how is the channel that I'm going to evaluate uh, my customers uh, through. And um, the purchase is how I'm going to get you to purchase my product. So uh, do I have a real shop? Do I do it online? Do I have my representatives who will go to your workplace or to your home or to your school to sell and, and deliver the value to you? So the delivery is the other end, so how, how do I deliver the value? Um, um, do I use my own people? Do I use uh, a third party, a partner? Um, when, um, who, who bought, uh, um, let's say, Apple products online? Okay, so how, how was this? What did you buy, an iPad or? You, you bought a MacBook. Okay, so how, how, was, it, how was it delivered to you? Shipping uh, company. So, so there was a, someone from, I don't know, DHL or, yeah, they, they came. So Apple didn't really have their own shipping uh, department, someone with an Apple attire who came and gave it to you. So, no, right? So this is how, how uh, you use a third party kind of service to deliver um, the, uh, the, the, the value. Then the after sales is an extremely important um, uh, aspect of, uh, of the service. So you, th this MacBook, if it has an issue, do you know where to go to? Uh, do you think if you go there, they will really you know, work with you and uh, try to help you with your, uh, with your issue and make sure that your, um, your experience is not jeopardized? This is extremely important. And uh, customer service in, in general. So you have booked um, an, an airline ticket and now you want to um, cancel it. What, what will happen? So, so this, this is where people make choice. So if, for example, if you have purchased an Air, an Air Asia ticket and you couldn't travel, how much they will refund you? They won't refund you. This, this is a clear policy. You know, this is a very simplistic kind of process. Uh, this is a low cost. Please make sure you are there. Um, you won't be able to change the the flight time, and so, so you know the consequences of dealing with this. So, but if you are uh, uh, having a, uh, an open ticket from, uh, let's say, Malaysia Airlines system, you can fly within a year. You just let them know you are not coming, and uh, they will just reschedule you. So it's, it's a different customer service. How do you deliver it? How do you communicate it so that people are aware? So we know when we buy an Air Asia ticket, you know, if, if we miss it, it's too bad. We just don't go. We don't go and fight with them or, or complain because we understand the structure and, and how, does it, um, how does it work. So, uh, so that's, that was about the, the, the channels uh, and how you deliver the value. Now, I, when you do your, uh, when you do your uh, business plan or when you write your uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem for your specific project, I again want you to think of this. So you think of the value being here, it has been established, it's either new, cheap, reliable, uh, it, it gives you status, whatever you have decided on, and you, have, you know that this is something that your customer wants. Now, how do I deliver this is the question. So you, you have to go over to how do I create awareness? How do I market this? How do I ensure that there is an after sale or customer service kind of uh, uh, avenue for my customers to let me know how did they feel about my service? Do I 
actively ask them, how was the service? Or do I just wait if they have a, if they keep quiet, it means okay. If they have complaint, they will come to me. If they do have a complaint, do I actively tell them, uh, look, uh, if you have feedback, this is my website, and I'm going to respond to you within, um, I don't know, two working days. You know, these kind of, of, of things are extremely important, and they have to be captured when you are preparing your uh, business model. Now, this is a very important part, which is the revenue and cost. This is a very simple uh, equation. So revenue is your income. So when you are selling your, the goods, that's the revenue. When you subtract the cost, how much did the good or the service cost you? So for example, you pay that much of money for, to Taylor's University, but Taylor's have to pay me, have to pay the other people, have to build this campus. So all this is the cost. Now, if the revenue is higher than the cost, we will have profit. If the cost is higher than the revenue, we will end up in a loss. So this is very simple, a uh, very simple equation. Uh, we need to uh, be aware of. Now, if you talk about the revenue, how do businesses achieve revenue? These are the major um, ways to achieve revenue. So asset sale is if I have this and I sell to you, and then you give me the money. So that's the clearest thing when you sell something. It could be as simple as a cup of coffee or as complicated as uh, uh, a house or a car. So this is how you, you do the uh, asset sale. Now, sometimes there is a usage fee. So you, you utilize my facilities and you pay me. You rent the car for a day and you pay me for that. The car is mine, it's not yours, but you, you rent it, you use it, and, and you pay me for, for that. Sometimes there is a subscription fee. Um, you, you use uh, uh, an online service, you subscribe for that for, I don't know how many months, they will send you the information or they give you access. So for example, the databases that we are using in our, uh, in our uh, you see the coffee remind me that I have coffee here. So the, the databases that we have in our uh, library, it doesn't belong to us. We subscribe to the people who have uh, collected the uh, the uh, database, which the, the, for them maybe doesn't, they don't own it as well. So they put many journals and e-resources together, and then we pay them an annual fee. The moment we don't pay them, you won't be able to access the resources um, uh, online. So this is the subs subscription fee. Now renting is very clear. Any one of you who's renting an apartment would understand what what's renting um, means. Uh, licensing is when, um, again, it's something like subscription, but slightly different, whereby uh, I do have a software that I allow you to use. So there is terms and conditions for this license. You cannot copy it, you cannot share it with others. Although you have paid a big amount of money for this software, the agreement, you know, every software that you, you even download, sometimes for free, you say, okay, click on agree, only then it will install, is where the, there is a licensing agreement that you won't be using it for um, certain uh, kind of work and uh, you won't be able to, uh, again, you know, copy it and share it with others, so that's the, the licensing. Brokerage fee is when someone does things on your behalf. So, for example, you want to buy shares, you don't go and buy them yourself. There's a broker, someone who knows how to buy and sell, and then you will pay that person a fee for this. So these are the major ways to create a revenue for a business. Now, the uh, cost. Is what will I pay for the resources that I use, the partnerships that I uh, have established, those people who provide me with extra resources and services that I don't have, I don't personally have, 
but I need so that I could deliver the service. Um, so what's, what's, the, what's the costing uh, mechanism? So there are, there are a few ways to, to do that. One is low cost. So low cost would be, let's say if we take AirAsia as an example, they will build everything around how to make uh, the model cheap. So we will, um, anything that we think is unnecessary, we don't provide. You, you know, you, their, their, uh, their planes don't even have the uh, entertainment system. So that brings down the cost of the airplane, brings down the maintenance cost. Now, if you want, they will give you something like an iPad, which is actually not that good anyway. So they, they, they don't want to go into providing these additional things because if their cost becomes very similar to that of the Malaysian airline system, no one will, will take the service. So they have to keep always thinking of how to keep it low cost. So again, driving it back to your um, uh, entrepreneurial um, model that you are working on for your project, once you decided that my value proposition is this and my customer is this, then if the customer is very cost sensitive, then maybe a low cost is the way to go. Now, once you decide that your business is gonna be a low cost business, then you really need to make sure that you get the value for every dollar that you spend so that you can pass the saving back to your, uh, your customer. Um, variable cost is when you will charge different people differently. Like again, the telcos. So you have uh, uh, a, a, a prepaid plan, which is can go for, you buy for five days or a week or a month. And uh, there's the postpaid plans. The postpaid plans also are, are different from one, uh, one plan to the other. So you have, I don't know, 50 ringgit plan. You have 250 ringgit plan. So this is how you make your costing different. So you don't have everything the same. So if you look at AirAsia, it's actually very consistent, it's, it, generally speaking. But if you look at the telcos, because of the, um, they want to cater for a, a huge market, very diversified market, they have to come up with uh, a variable cost. There's a new term that's called, you know, you've heard of a premium, but have you heard of a freemium? So this is, this is really when, okay, how many of you have uh, used Wikipedia? Have you, haven't you used Wikipedia? You know what Wikipedia is? You don't use it. You don't trust it. Sometimes. So w Wikipedia, so, uh, so when you last time used it, how much did you pay? Oh, you, you, you didn't pay anything. So, so that's free? Yeah. OK, what, what, what email service do you use? Gmail, Gmail. And Hotmail. Gmail and Hotmail. Yeah. So uh, is, it, is it good? Yeah, and uh, good, yeah. so you have enough uh, uh, space, and you can send emails. It's yeah. very reliable yeah, for free. Enough space, yeah. Right. So and you have enough space. Yeah. And how much do you pay for that? Zero. Zero. Um, who used Dropbox? Maybe someone else. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. Okay. So how much did you pay for Dropbox? Uh, free. Free. Now this is an this is an important notion. Skype is free, Dropbox is free, Gmail is free, and especially for your generation, you guys are used for getting things for free. So the business has to be able to find ways so that they give you what you want for free and maybe use you somehow to generate value for someone else. So, so for example, in terms of uh, Google is actually a very rich company, isn't it? Yeah, maybe someone want to have a discussion with me on this? Yes. So Google is quite a rich company. Yes. And they are giving emails for free. Yep. And uh, Google Translate for free. Yes. And images for free. So how do they make money? Advertisement. So advertisement. Now, now is the fact that we all, or most of us, use the 
the, their search engine is important for their advertisement? Yes, it is. It's extremely important. Correct. So if you look at, if you, if you remember the uh, ecosystem that we have uh, drawn in the beginning, we are the ones who rush to catch the apple because it's free. We want to have it because it fall, before it falls down. By, by the virtue of having hundreds of millions of people using the service, they could go to the corporates and advertise. So the, corporate, the corporates will come to go to Google and say, look, if you see someone writing an email and saying, I'm thinking of doing a degree in engineering, can you please just bombard them with all these ads about how great this university is and how good and recognized their degrees are? You try it. You write, I'm going to London. And you will see all the ads next to your emails about hotels in London, restaurants in London, and things like that. So, so having the free, non-paying customers becomes extremely important for Google to make money from a different you know, direction. So you need to think of, are you going that pathway? Are you going in, in that way, in the freemium way? The economy of scale is when you go and maybe work even with your competitor to, um, to so let's say we both sell gold. If I go alone and buy that much, I said goes and buy that much, the person who is selling the gold will charge us you know, a higher price. But if we create an association for goldsmith, and then we go together and we purchase in bulk, and then we subdivide among ourselves, then we have an economy of scale. Now that can happen not only in terms of uh, physical things, it can happen also in terms of like software. So for example, the learning management system that we are using, uh, where you guys can you know, access your uh, 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 courses, pay your fees, uh, check your timetable. Um, the, the more people use it, we can, if we have like 10 universities want to use it, we can customize it, we can, and then we can share the cost. So instead of everyone does a different system, if people do standardize, you will have an economy of scale. So this is, a, again, a very important part of the um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem. It's really like the oxygen or the blood for, for, your, uh, for your business. Any question about the cost and the revenue? Please? Yes, there's a question here. Just wait for the mic, please. OK. So. Renting is when you rent an apartment, for example. So you are, you, are, you are renting the apartment for a certain period. We have an agreement. We, but if you go to a hotel and you stay for a night, do you sign an agreement with them and you say, I'm renting this room and there is a complicated thing? You are just using the the, the, um, the, the service for a, a, a limited period. Then are, there are some services that we use like very short you know, time, like, like a taxi, for example. So uh, the, the usage is like when you, it, it's a simpler, normally in shorter kind of terms, doesn't require much paperwork compared to the, to the renting. Now, these are, are the main ways to, um, to generate uh, revenue, but they are not the only ones. Yeah. And I would like to um, you know, invite you to use them as a, as a, as a guide. Now, um, th there are people who, can, who um, in maybe less developed part of the world, they, their business is they have a mo literally one mobile phone in a village. and. You can come and rent it. You can make a call because you, you, maybe you, you don't have your own. So you can rent from me. So this is, uh, sorry, you can, you can use it. You rent it for a short period. So this is really a, a sort of usage kind of fee. Use it for five minutes and you pay me that, that much compared to when you, you know, rent something for a longer period. Very good question. I, thank you very much. Any other question? 
regarding this. This is actually an extremely important part of the ecosystem. And especially when you are we're working with, with engineers, because often engineers focus on the technology part. Yeah, there's another question, please. Yeah, I'd like to ask about the premium service. Yes. Uh, like for Google, okay, um, it is a multinational company. It's yes. Very popular. Uh, but like, for, how do you start a premium service when a company doesn't have enough publicity? When it's not popular enough? Right. Because, uh, like, obviously, companies will want to advertise in the, 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 the free, I mean, the company that's offering a yes. premium service. Yes. But if there's not enough, uh, people that are actually using your service mm -hmm. who want the companies that who offer their um, who want to pay you for their advertisement sure wouldn't they like uh, hesitate okay so so uh, l let me just try to rephrase to uh, to make sure that I understood the question your question is Google is Google is a multinational company with like hundreds of millions of users so they know that they can generate the interest in, in advertising. But you want to start a new thing. How do you start it as a freemium? Did I get, actually, yes. okay. This is the way Google started. Do you know how did Google start? Okay, Google started by a couple of students, just like you guys, who created um, in their university a new search engine. And this was on the university server. Okay? They're just like having an... Suddenly, one day, the university server was jammed because of the traffic that there was generated. And ha they have never charged anything for this. So the university said, look, we cannot handle this here. You need to find another way. So what did they do? They went out and say, look, this service seems to be very promising. We haven't really advertised it, and people are using it. We've I'm just creating the numbers here. I don't have really the numbers. So let's say they go and say, can you imagine? We've got a thousand users using it. So to them, maybe that was like a, a big kind of thing because previously the, uh, we used to, uh, what was the most popular search engine before Google? Yeah. Yahoo, right? So suddenly this is something done by, by, by amateurs, by students, but people finding it more interesting, it's giving them better results. So what did they do? They went out and looked for some people to finance them. Now, this is a very important step where most of the businesses don't make it across that. So, so they went and the venture capitalists looked and said, this looks very promising. So we will give you a bit more money so that you can employ a few more people and have your own servers and Let's see how we will be able to generate money out of this. So through that, they managed to build the scale. Now, it's very interesting to note that it's only in hindsight now we know that advertisement is the way to make money because that time, they actually don't know how to make money. So they know that there are so many users and they know the moment they start charging the users, the users will just disappear. So this has to be a free service. But how do I generate money from this? And then someone thought of it, and now it sounds like, yeah, it should have been like that. But actually, it wasn't that clear at that time. Now, if you look at Facebook, it's exactly the same story. So someone uh, builds a, you know, a sort of a web page for himself and his colleagues to to interact and suddenly this becomes popular and people from other parts of, you know, outside their network wanting to join and say, oh, sounds like something interesting. And again, someone needs to come in and support them with the cash. So that's, that's the time where hopefully by, by, by the end of, 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 of our course, you guys will be able to, gen to build the business plan and also be able to present it to a venture, venture capitalist. So the key thing is, when you come to, to me and you want my money to support you, what are you going to tell me about your projections? How are you going to convince me that this is something that will change the world so that I give you my money and take risk with you? 
and what will I get later? So this will, these are the, the skills that an entrepreneur needs because often you don't have the money to bring your idea to, to realization. Make sense? Yeah. Great, thanks. Any other question? Okay, so let's move on then. Now, the resources. Anything that you want to do, you will need at least one of these resources that I'm going to display now. You need physical resources. You may or may not, but there are one of the resources that you will need. So physical resources uh, include things like the campus, the lecture theater, the library. These are our physical resources. If you, if you have Starbucks, the shop, the machines that make the coffee are physical resources. As a matter of fact, even if you look at a service like the search engine provided by Google, do you think they need physical resources or not? Yeah, because there is, their, their servers are somewhere. Their HQ is somewhere. And I, I think their campus, the Google campus, is quite large. It's not, it's not small. Although we don't really interact with that, but for them to be able to deliver the service, they will need some sort of physical resources. They need, you, you may or may not need intellectual resources. So intellectual resources are the patents that your business may need, or the trade secret, or um, the knowledge that your lecturers have. All these are intellectual resources. For you to deliver the business, you know, even if you are selling chicken rice, do you think there's some intellectual resource there? Jonathan says no. Jonathan, if you are selling chicken rice, no. Just say, oh, just say it. No. No. Okay, who disagrees with him? Okay, we have, okay, we have someone who dis disagrees here. Can you just wait for the mic and tell us why you think chicken rice has an intellectual resource? Uh, the recipe. So the recipe is, definitely is an intellectual resource. That's exactly right. And, and, and that's why you say this chicken rice is better than the other chicken rice. So, so intellectual resources, are a central part of anything that you do. You know, even the, um, the, um, our administrative staff, when they deal with you, when you, see, you go and say, I want to drop this course, how do you think this individual is able to guide you through? And you will see it only when it breaks down. So if you go there and the girl says, I'm new, can you come later? Then you know that there is an intellectual gap. She, she hasn't been trained yet. She doesn't know how to do it for you. Human resources are, you know, generally the, uh, very much linked to the intellectual uh, resources. Intellectual resources, <clears throat> we would like to say it's, it's our documentation, it's our recipe if we get it written. The human resources is the people who will bring the service to life. So it's, the lecturer who, who lectures, the, uh, the, uh, the cleaner who cleans the toilet, the um, person who makes sure that the lights are working, the air condition is working, and, and, and things like that. And financial resources is really the, the money. So these are the major resources that a business or an entrepreneurial uh, kind of um, inter, uh, uh, endeavor would need. And when you are making your business plan, where you are making your presentation about your new idea that you are very excited about, often um, you, may, you may forget about the resources that you need to, to develop this. And it's very important to keep this in the um, uh, clear and present in your mind. Because if you are asking someone else to to help you, to join you, to pay with their money, they will need to know what kind of resources do you need. Do you have the resources? So for example, if, if we need some, um, if we, we want to manuf manufacture um, certain, um, we, we need to manufacture uh, a satellite. Do we have the intellectual resources? Is everything that we need purchasable? Because there are certain things that are literally, you know, state secret, you know, only certain country has it, 
and it's owned by the government, and they don't want even to sell it. So do I have everything that I need? Or do I have access to everything I need for me to be able to, to build, let's say, a satellite, if I'm thinking of, of a satellite? So these are the resources that the business needs, and we need to be very much aware of, of, uh, of them. So we talked about the resources. We talked about the cost and revenue. And now we want to talk about the business activities. So the business activities could be manufacturing, production. This could be if you are making uh, this device or the computer or even baking a cake. Um, could be solution provision. So maybe my business is, uh, I don't really make things, but you come and say, I have this issue, I help you to solve it. Or maybe uh, if I am um, um, a person who provides a psychological service, you come to me and you tell me about your issue and I help you, talk you through. So I'm, I'm providing you with a solution and this is still a business activity, an important business activity. And you will be willing to pay for it. You go to a lawyer and a uh, lawyer will you know, help you with a contract. Maybe the contract is still a physical thing, but sometimes you go and they just give you an advice. It could be a verbal advice to say, look, I think you should do this. I think you should do that. Or I advise you to do this and you will pay a fee for this, even if you didn't really make physically uh, something. And services in general are, are business activities. So this could be you know, a haircut is a service. Um, um, uh, a massage is, is a service. So these are things that, you know, something done to you or on you or for you, but it's not uh, a product that you will take with you. So it is, is a service. So these are the, the business activities. Now, uh, depending on how complex the business is, uh, this could be few things or could be a list of literally thousands of, 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 of things that a business needs to do in order for developing and delivering the, the business value or the value proposition that we are um, giving to our customer. Okay, any question regarding the business activities? Okay. I'll talk about the um, partnerships. So, as I told you, I, I don't think anyone in this complex world would be able to own everything that they need to deliver the value proposition to their customer. And this happens at the level of corporates or companies or even countries. So if you think about it, the more complex and global the service or the product that we are delivering, the more we are going to be dependent on other people to help us and partner with us and also on, on getting things from other parts of the world. So for example, we know that most of the petroleum is uh, produced in the Middle East and uh, Japan is dependent on that. So it's very important for them to partner with the countries that make or produce the petroleum so that uh, you know, they can keep their industrial uh, machinery running. That's just, just an example. But this could be, um, um, the partnership could also be strategic alliance between non-competitors. Non so, um, for example, um, this is a university. We need to buy furniture. And we need to have other services. A school, a high school, is not our competitor. But maybe they need a similar furniture. So if we can come together we will become, we have the economy of scale, or we can do things in a better way, we can do our training together. So we are not really competing against each other, but we can, um, we can um, add value through the part partnership. Partnership is going to benefit both, both of us. Now, sometimes the competitors need to cooperate. So this is co 
competition. So it's cooperation plus competition. I give you an example. This is this is a this is a real example. Um, Malaysia wants to be um, a regional educational hub for the world. So people, they, if you think of having a degree, Malaysia would like to think that, or would like the people of the world to think, well, we can go to Australia, America, UK, and maybe Malaysia. So it provides a different experience, and there is a different value proposition. Now, for us to be able to attract uh, students from other parts of the world, so who, who, is, who is, besides the exchange students, who is, who is not from Malaysia? Okay, so how was the visa processing? Was it, was it an easy process or was it a bit difficult? Um, compared to before, it's a bit difficult now. Right. Uh, I've been here for eight years. So right. <laughs> previously, it was much easier. Right. But now it's getting more tougher, probably because there are more international students coming. Right. And actually, they can feel the pressure to deal with a lot of people. Right. So maybe it's getting tougher. Right, okay. That, that's actually a very good and very true observation. So the immigration department, they, they want to really give this visa to genuine students. But at the same time, there are genuine students who want to study, but they cannot start the course of study because the processing of the visa becomes you know, very lengthy. Now, this doesn't affect only our university. It affects the other universities. Now, you just think of this. If our university goes to the immigration department and say, look, I have these 20 students who are stuck. Can you please process them faster? Do you think we will have um, a better chance of convincing the, uh, the uh, immigration department to cooperate with us when we go alone? Or if we go with 20 or 30 universities and we say, look, University A has 100 students, University B has, collectively, we are we have a thousand students who is waiting to come, but because of the tougher processing procedures now, they are unable to come and study, and these people may just leave and go to somewhere else. So although we are competing for the students, but now it's better to cooperate on that specific issue. So suddenly a competitor could become a partner. So this is very important. To, to understand and to know that the, the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem is um, very dynamic. So at times I need to pr protect myself against maybe the, the, uh, the competitor and watch the competitor, but at times I could go and speak to the competitor and work with, with, with them. Um, joint ventures are... Um, Another form of partnership where um, to do that kind of uh, entrepreneurial activity, maybe I don't have enough money or I don't have enough skills or I don't have enough time, then I join venture with someone. So it's a, part, it's a clear form of partnership that we both have an interest in this to work. So this is called a joint venture. And this could happen between individuals or it could happen between companies as well. And um, the other very clear uh, partnership is the buyer-supplier relationship. So those people who sold us the, the tables uh, are our suppliers, and we are there, you know, we buy, we buy from them. So there's a partnership. It's very important for, for us that these people give us good quality tables, deliver them on time, um, um, service them if they are broke down, and, and, and so on. Now this is, uh, I have two more, I believe, the competitor and the business. So the competitor are those people who are in a very similar business to us and are interested in having our customers. And they are, I believe, very important people also to keep us on our toes in terms of um, in terms of uh, you know, improving our quality and uh, our efficiency. There are some companies who can actually destroy or buy over the competitor 
but they specifically don't do it because they believe it's good to have a competitor. Because if you don't have a competitor as an individual or even as a business, you will become, you know, compliant and you will uh, not be as paranoid about, you know, providing your customers with a service that you are supposed to, to provide them. So when you are working on your business plan or business idea or entrepreneurial um, activities, you need to think of the competitor analysis. I've spoken to some of you, and um, there was a group that was working uh, or thinking of uh, having a gym, or the, the business plan is about, about a gym. It's very important to think, so who is the, who is the competitor? What are they doing? Is, is really my um, value proposition unique? Um, how big is the market? How many of these customers are already registered or, or, or signed up for the other gym? And how do I penetrate this market? So the competitor analysis is very important. And again, this may sound like a very trivial question, but it's a very important one. Who is your competitor? Um, just like Air Asia, if they say my competitor is the bus, you know, this will drive them to think in a totally different way. So they will say that my tickets start from 10 ringgit. This is around like three US dollar. Now, if the bus charge you 60 or 50 ringgit to go from point A to point B, while the airline ticket starts from, from 10, I think you are, this is serious competition for, for, for the bus and will drive you in, a, in a thinking in a different way. But if you think that my competitor is only the other airline, I think that will drive the thinking in a different direction. So this is not a trivial um, question. Who is my customer? Which is very similar to the question of, sorry, who is my competitor? Which is very similar to the question that we asked in the beginning, who is my customer? And you need to really spend a bit of time um, thinking um, about that. And you also need to ask yourself, what can the competitors offer my customer? What is the thing that they, 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 they can offer that maybe I won't be able to offer as well as they do? The other very important thing is, what is the competitive advantage they do have over me? You need to be very aware of this. So if your company is new and there is an established company and you want to compete against them, then you need to have it very clear in your mind that this company maybe has more experience, maybe has more people, maybe they have more money, whatever. You need to really think very critically of your position. This is not to say, oh, there is no hope, but for you to be aware of um, the ecosystem that you are living within and to ensure that you will be able to, as a company or a business or an entrepreneurial uh, endeavor, to be able to deliver the value that you are uh, proposing. This is, the last one is actually a very, very interesting point that I would like to share with you. And I think uh, companies like General Electric do that very actively. So what do they do? Let's say we, are, we all belong to company X. Then we say, okay, you, you, you. You go aside, and if you were our competitor, what would you do to bring us down? What would you do to take part of our market share with all the knowledge that you know about us? So these people will go out and then take off, you know, the General Electric hat, for example, and put the competitors had, and they think, this is the way we are going to do it. Then they come and present to the company and tell them, the competitor could do this, the competitor could do that. And that will drive the company to think differently, even if the competitor is not really doing that, but it will make you more prepared, will make you take care of, of your customer. So for example, if you visit your customer once every six months, and this group of people that you put out there to conspire to bring you down, they say, look, we're going to visit the customer 
every one month to just see what is the customer's needs, how do we take care of their needs and things like that. Then maybe you decide that, oh, I think six months is a very long period for us. Maybe we will start visiting every two months or every three months, depending on what you do, so that we, we are always, our, 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 our finger is on the pulse of the customer. We know what the customer wants, and if there are any changes in their requirements, we are aware of, of, of those changes and able to respond to them. The business environment is, again, a um, very interesting uh, part of the ecosystem. So what is the prevalent market conditions? You need to ask yourself, is this a booming market? Is it recession? Uh, are people uh, earning money? Are they losing their jobs? This is a very important thing while you are thinking of what kind of business you want to, to spin off. And you'll find it very interesting that in both um, bad and good times, the entrepreneurial people will always have a way to add value. So if it rains, an entrepreneur will sell umbrellas. If, if there is a, a, um, you know, a natural disaster, then an entrepreneur will, will, will be able to maybe sell uh, uh, relief rations or um, instant food or, or things like that. So you, you always have to be driven by understanding what is the current and prevalent market condition. So this is a very important thing to ask ourselves. Now, what is the legislative system or framework within which the, your, your business is operating. You know, this is related to things, for example, if you are in X company or an X country, and this country is giving tax release, reliefs for a certain technology. So for example, Malaysia now is very interested in green technology. And there are so many uh, incentives to, for companies to invest in this. So this is something that you need to be aware of because guess what, the competitor is working on this and they are aware of, of, of it. So if there are some, some um, uh, tax relief um, incentives that the government is giving, you need to be aware of that so that you can exploit them and make uh, use of them. And the environment, what opportunities does it, does it provide? So for example, sometimes um, something happens and there is suddenly awareness about a certain disease, or there's awareness about um, some climate change issues, then maybe this is the time is opportune to introduce something that you, know, you don't need to, um, to, uh, um, to spend so much money to create awareness for. And what are the threats? So sometimes the environment has threats. Not everything you will be able to convert into, into an opportunity. So if there are threats, how do you protect yourself against that? How do you put the legal um, uh, things, the legal aspects of, of, uh, um, of your business right so that um, uh, people won't just simply sue you because of uh, the coffee was too hot or, you know, because these are threats that could happen in, in a certain environment. So for example, in Malaysia, I don't think if I get hot coffee, I will think of suing uh, Starbucks, but we know in th this was a real case in North America where people go and sue the the uh, coffee uh, company or the coffee shop because they didn't say it's hot. So, so this is something that could happen. You know, it could be specific to a certain uh, a certain environment, and you need to be aware of that. So, I'm done. The assignment, we will, after we upload the, um, this uh, lecture online, there will be a quiz. It's a multiple choice question, so please do that. But most importantly is the, um, the business um, or the entrepreneurial ecosystem that I would like you to do. So I'll put this also online. So I would like you to pick the business. So the business name could be whatever. I don't know, Taylor's University, Wikipedia. Um, you, you pick something or X, Y, Z, chicken rice. is entirely up to you. Uh, Marks and Spencer's, 
whatever you want to, to, to choose, then you, you say what is the value proposition using the framework that we have provided. What are the customer segments? And then, what are the resources they need? What are the business activities? What does the environment that they are operating in provide? Who are their partners and who are their competitors? And very important is, what is their cost structure and revenue streams? So is it low cost? Is it freemium? Is it, how, how does it work? And how do they make money? So if you, could, if you need more space, you can always expand on this. But it would be good if we could put everything in, in one uh, page so that we can sort of tell a story. Because later, I would like you to do the same for the project that you are going to work on. I am done. So do you have any questions? Yes. Can you please speak? This is individual work, right? Uh, this is an individual exercise, yes. Yes. So you'll be picking a business that you are interested in. And, and I'm, I'm very interested in um, maybe the businesses that we are not used to. I mean, if you could pick a successful entrepreneur from your country, and maybe you add a little bit of introduction. And uh, so, so, so someone may want to do the Dabavalas? I don't know. This is a very interesting thing that is that's different, yeah. But you, you could do IKEA, you could do um, uh, an educational institution, you could do a charity, you could do Wikipedia. Very, Wikipedia would be very interesting because it doesn't charge, but how do they make um, the money? Because they do have staff, they do have, um, they do have cost. So what is their revenue stream? Where does it come from? Is, is very, very important. Yes. Yes, please, there's a question here. Just wait for the mic, please. We use this as the same thing as our project. I mean. Yes, so, so you will. I mean, later we're going to do a project, right? Yes. Can this be the same thing as that? But th the one that you will do will be for your project. Yeah, yeah. So if your project is a gym, but you, the, the exercise that I want you to do is not for your project. No, it's for an existing business. Oh. Yes, so I want something that is existing and successful, and you talk about it. So I don't want you to, to, to use this. So there will be, be two things. Yeah. Any other question, please? OK, if you don't have any other question, I would like to thank you very much. And um, see you on Friday. Thanks a lot.